Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O oh Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord. So that is Psalms chapter 89, verses 15 through 18. And I'll read it for you in the New Living Translation uh, that says this. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship. For they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They exult in your righteousness. You are their glorious strength. It pleases you to make us strong. Yes, a protection comes from the Lord. And he, the Holy One of Israel, has given us our King. And so here we have the precious Word of God speaking to us a phrase, a call to praise, a call to worshiping God. So as we understand what Praising and living for God is. I'm sure most of you have read the bulletin this morning, which I included a very important short message for you. What on earth am I here for? And it tells us, as uh, there in Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, it begins with praise. Praise be to the Lord God our Father. This is means this means worship. We worship him for what he has done the way he has done everything in a fallen world, in a fallen universe. And as it says, God had a plan for us and he has fulfilled it regardless of everything gone wrong. And so we have here that God has planned everything for us. We're planned for his joy. We're created for his family. We're created to be like Christ. We're changed to serve. And we're equipped for a mission in this life. So as we look at one of the most important truths of worship in the Bible, we want to understand that worship is what causes our victory and enables us to continually look at our lives through God's perspective. The truth is, if we get a hold of that, that will cause us to keep our lives God-centered and focused and will help us to continually overcome the circumstances that challenge our lives in everyday life. I want to make this point very clearly. Most Christians fail in life when they stop worshiping God on a daily basis. Most Christians fail in life when they stop worshiping God on a daily basis. They relegate God to the Sunday box and their lives begin to deteriorate into the same quality of life and the same burdens of the common soul that has no Jesus Christ in their lives. It becomes a dry routine and a meaningless existence. So we find victory in worship. Victory in worship is our ability to praise God continually and through everything. And how important our praise to God is in keeping our focus centered on Jesus Christ is there is not enough to express that because there is real power in for living in what he has accomplished for us. Philippians 3 verses 8 through 10 the Apostle Paul says, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection 
and fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What is Paul saying? He's saying there is power in worshiping Christ. There is power in suffering for him as long as we worship through that suffering. And so he makes it very clear in his statements. Not only that, it helps us to already experience the sense of the coming resurrection of all who have died in Christ and for Christ. So we have been called to give praise to God. Consider the fact that God has truly called us to give praise to him continually and to glorify his name in everything we do. We must praise God and should always, it should always be part of our everyday life cycle to praise God. If you only praise God here on Sunday, then you do not praise God adequately for it, will, it is not sufficient to get you through life. And every single day is a new spiritual journey filled with its challenges, regardless of how routine it may seem. It isn't something we just do when we come into this assembly. It's something we do on an individual basis. Psalms 22, 23 says, You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Did you hear that? That you may proclaim the praises of him. It is a life of praise, a life of worship. So it is through praise that God wants us to acknowledge who he is and what he has done for us. It's a time to acknowledge Christ. It is a way to express our love and our gratitude for his having done so great things for us, for getting that great victory and sealed our hearts so that we can live for him on a daily basis. Daily worship then culminates in Sunday worship. The Sunday worship is the climax of the weekly worship process. Psalms 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalms 35, 28, and my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. So the scripture points out very clearly that God desires each one of us to give him praise, to give him glory. All that is due him as our God and our creator and the Lord that loves us. In Psalms 92, you also find a very interesting introduction there, verses 1 and 2. It says, it's good to praise the Lord and make music in your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So this is a daily process. It's something that occurs every day. So praise is the language of love for God. And so we understand to live in this manner, praising God. So regardless of our position in the world, we can experience victory in Jesus, in worshiping God. Then God has ordained victory to praise. That is, the essence of Christianity is about praising especially about praising God during hard times and suffering. Uh, there's the example in the Old Testament of Jehoshaphat, where he has to deal with the enemies of the people. They are being attacked and ravaged. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 18, he says, Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, and against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, then those, the enemies were defeated. They were praising through the time of hardships. They were being assaulted by these different nations, and yet they would praise, and it would help them overcome. So this kind of victory is for all who praise the Lord God. 
This is the same victory that the Lord wants to give us when we come before him and praise and worship. It is a victory over the trials, the troubles in our lives. And we need to realize that it is through worship that we get through that. It's so important to understand how God sees us as we worship him and he loves us and accepts us and moves all things for our good because we worship him. So when we offer God a praise, we're causing him to arise in our midst and put to flight all those spiritual enemies that attack us in life and seek to destroy us. Then victory comes through the sacrifice of praise. Why sacrifice? Why the word sacrifice? Because the word sacrifice always means giving something that we give to no one else. Giving something we would not normally give. And most of it means giving our hearts to the Lord. Giving our lives to God. There have been many famous people who have given up their fame, have given up careers to give their lives to the Lord. It is a sacrifice and they live a worshipful life. If you go there to Job chapter 1 in your Old Testament, you're going to find this old saint of God being tested. And you'll find that as he loses everything. And it's an interesting story to read. You can read most of what went on in chapters 1 and 2 of Job, and then jump to the last chapter, and you basically got everything that went on in his life. In between, it's dealing with the pain. It's dealing with the suffering. But in Job 1, you find that Satan, God's enemy, your enemy, my enemy, is arranging the destruction of Job. He destroys his wealth. He destroys his family. He destroys his property. He almost destroys his reputation because all those that are around him believe that the only reason he's suffering is because he must be evil. There must be something bad about Job. And there's human tendency to think that way. But God shows that it has nothing to do with Job because Job pleases and worships God. In Job 1.20 it says that this Job got up, he tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell on the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You see, he worshipped. He worshipped. But you know what's interesting is that as Job comes out of his turmoil, and he's blessed greatly, he receives double of what he had before. Everything is much better by the time God blesses him after he survives these horrible assaults, satanic assaults. You find that his friends are his enemies. They are philosophically and morally his enemies because they are accusing him of something he didn't do. If Job was to believe one moment what they said, Job would fail. Job would give up. But he didn't. And please remember that at times in life that we are faced with critical choices, the enemy will bring faces that are familiar to us and give us the wrong advice, although it sounds legitimate, although it sounds reasonable. But when it goes against what we know God expects of us, be assured it is the wrong advice. And so Job said, it is not as you say, I have kept my integrity with the Lord God. And so here Job worships in the midst of turmoil and disaster. And God blesses the praise that comes in the midst of great trials, of great difficulties, of ordeals and persecution, sickness, grief, oppression, temptations. 
relational difficulties, financial problems. If we praise God in the midst of this, the Lord God will bless us. But you know, we humans have the tendency instead to accuse God, to question God, to blame God instead of praising God. May we grow the proper spirit and learn to praise God. The next time we face difficulty, let us praise God. Learn to do so. Defy the impulse that is the contrary to praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, we read these words. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, many have interpreted that it speaks of singing. Well, that might include singing. But whatever it is, it means worship. Worship God. He's talking to suffering Christians in the letter to the Hebrews. These people are fighting for their lives. And he says, you worship God. You praise him. And give thanks to his name. For he has greater things waiting for you. You know, the most interesting thing about the story of Job for me is that Job never finds out that there are unseen forces at work in his life. God never told Job Satan was behind it. Never said a word to him about it. Job never knew. But he didn't question God. Look at Jonah. When Jonah tries to run from God and, and not preach the message God says to preach, Jonah he finds himself in these horrible circumstances. He's thrown out of a ship in the midst of the storm only to be swallowed by a giant fish. And God preserves him inside that fish for three days. And Jonah says in Jonah 2 verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray what I have vowed. And salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Isn't that amazing? Jonah praised. Jonah worshipped. So instead of murmuring and complaining about his situation, he did what he should do. He turned his attention to worshiping God. And believe me, he didn't feel like worshiping. It wasn't about feeling. It was about knowing. It was about character. It was about his heart toward God. Silas and Paul in prison in Acts 16, verse 22. While in prison, they were found praising God. These guys were shackled in the stocks. It means they were locked up with hands and feet and pieces of wood hanging in midair. And that's very painful. And they said they were singing in hymns. And as a result, do you hear that? As a result of their worship, there was a great earthquake that shook the foundations of the prisons. So as we consider then worship in the midst of trial, remember this is for us to understand. We are living through difficult times culturally. We are living through difficult times politically. We are living through difficult times financially, economically, and we are headed for economic and political disaster. Then we must prepare ourselves to worship, and we must worship now and worship then. Remember our ancient brothers and sisters, the first, second, and third centuries of Christianity. They spent their time praising and worshiping God. Although it was all about persecution, what astounded their persecutors and murderers in the arenas was their ability to cling to each other and to sing together, praising and worshiping God while being ravaged by wild animals. 
And as one ancient writer stated, the blood of these Christians is the seed of their message, for the more we kill, the more they become. So every Christian that died produced another ten because of his worship to God. You want the change of emptiness that you find yourself bound up in from time to time to be loose by the power of God so you can get on with your victory in Jesus? Then learn to worship. Learn to worship and praise God in the midst of your difficulty. And he will set you free. So let us conclude. Remember that King Saul perished by his own sword. He led a tremendous career and then suddenly things began to go downward because he forgot to worship God. He forgot to give God the credit. So we are more in danger. We more, are more in danger of falling by our own sword than by the enemy's sword. It is, a, it is called indifference and ineffective living. It is losing focus on Jesus. It is losing the love of worshiping God in our daily lives. Some Christians bring the old man into the new life. They harbor the old mindset in the new man. And that always leads to stagnancy and defeat. Your mind wants to rule you. It wants to control you. The old mind doesn't want to submit to the Spirit of God in the action of praise and worship. It's up to you. It's your choice to bring your mind and life into submission and determine to praise God every day, especially in the midst of hard times. And then he will replace the spirit of unbelief with the garment of worship and praise. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 3 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Jesus repeated these words in Luke chapter 4, referring to himself and his ministry. So it is through worship and praise that we are able to change our center of focus from us to God. And thus we are not distracted by the waves of all the occurrences in the world around us. And worship-filled living enables us to get our eyes off ourselves and on God and on Jesus Christ, who is able to lift us above the ash heap of life. Psalms 106, 47. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name to triumph in your praise. As we close, I will say to you, you can enjoy the wondrous power of victory and worship in Jesus Christ beginning today.